you know, we've been on this topic of the truth for the last few weeks because it's always in play in our culture, but it's especially in play since the beginning of COVID and right on through, and it just seems to be, to be ramping up even more. And you know, what one side would say is there's no such thing as truth, that it's all just a cultural convention. It's your truth is good for you. And we've learned that, no, that's wrong, sorry. And it's a little ironic because they are so steadfast in their opinion, they'll say, there's absolutely no absolutes. Which is a self-contradicting statement because you just said absolutely, right? So listen, we know there's a truth. You're here and, and if you're saved, you know that this word is truth. And that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We want to translate that into the way we interact with the lost and say, you should try this because what you're trying now is not nearly as good as this word. Is it easy? No, but is it worth it? Yes. And this picture really stopped me in my tracks, the girl on the right there, because it's so brilliantly done the way the, the artist put this face together. And, and even though she's got her hands over her face, you can't tell at first glance because it's a mask. And that's what we do. We hide because we know we fall short of the standard, right? That's built right into all of us. Good to see you too. I haven't seen you in a while. Um, we, we put this mask on because of shame. And, and you know, we don't like to talk about that. Shame is like one of the taboo subjects in our culture. But it's so comforting to know that God never turns his face away from us. There's nothing that we could have done that would cause him to say, sorry, you're disqualified. Nothing. Wow. Amazing how much love he has. And the world looks really beautiful. I mean, the, the temptation of sin is off the charts. He, he knows how to seduce us with all of the, of the lights and the glamour and the beauty. And, and, and I'm not meaning to speak a curse over people who are in the world. They just don't know any better. Nobody's presented them the gospel in a coherent way that, that their heart was open to that. So we should be so sensitive to Holy Spirit when we're talking to the lost, including people on your job. Hopefully they see there's something different about you, right? How come you're always so happy? You got some kind of happy pill you're taking? Uh, you know, it's Jesus. It's the Holy Spirit. It's the Word of God. I wake up in the morning and I feel like I have an assignment from heaven. And part of it is to get you out of your bad mood every day. You work in New York City, get on the subway, it looks like everybody had a bad breakfast and they're all upset about something. They don't want to look you in the eye. They're just ready to, like, throw down. Well, no, we're here to be a light for them, right? So there's the contrast is the sin looks great, but then you fall into sin, and then you live with this mask over you because you're ashamed that if anybody knew the real you, they wouldn't want to be with you anymore. And, and the, the culture today with all of the social media things that happen, it's even more of a cancel culture, so more than I have to hide. I don't want to let them see the real me because then they won't like me. So I have to put up some kind of imitation. Well, you don't have to do that with God. And he gave us the spirit of truth on the inside. How great is that? He gave us the word of God, and then he gave us the spirit of truth to live inside of us. So everything we need, we already have, but we have to access it. Study to show yourself approved. Put off the old man. Put on the new man, right? These are things. It's, you're not earning your salvation. You're saved, but you're earning the, 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 the joy of being closer and closer to be more like Jesus every day. That's a big difference. That's not earning. That's just putting effort in because you know the enemy wants to take you out. Anybody know that? That the enemy wants to take you out? The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's our enemy. He wants to take you out. God wants you to be this weapon of mass destruction for the enemy's camp. For this purpose, Jesus was manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. Well, he's manifest in all of us too. So this is an exciting thing of this power that we have. But... There's, there's this issue of sin, and that might sound really basic to you, but people don't even believe in sin anymore, right? Like, they weren't raised with it. They, they didn't have it in their family growing up. So it's, we, we talk to people, and they don't even realize some of the things the Bible talks about are sin. They don't know that it's a sin, right? Now, we do have this compass that we're born with, I believe, because we're made in the image of God, that we can know that, but it gets so buried under all the layers of the culture. So my text verse comes from Hebrews 11. It's an amazing chapter on faith. It's called the Hall of Faith, if you know that. And this is verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. You might remember this, 
the situation was that when he was a baby, there was an edict that all the children had to be killed. All the Jewish children had to be killed. And his mother had enough faith to float him down the river in a basket. And he happened to be found by Pharaoh's daughter who raised him. So am I saying it right? Okay, miracle, right? And then they found the mother to nurse the baby. So she still got to see him. Even though she was willing to give him away, she still got to raise him. So he was raised in the palace. But he turned it down. He refused to be, the, be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather, see, it's a choice, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the, come on, say it with me, the passing pleasures of sin. Anybody can relate to the passing pleasures of sin? Don't be putting your mask on now. It's okay. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Not this morning, hopefully. <laughs> but maybe in the parking lot. Won't go there. He chose to suffer. That sounds like a bad choice. No, because he knew the end was going to be better than the current situation. That's a good choice, Moses. Wise man. Rather than enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, and in another translation it will say the, the, the pleasures of sin for a season. That season ends quickly. And the season of pain and wreckage lasts way longer than the pleasure of sin. So I know it doesn't seem like a very happy message, but it will be. I promise. Jim, hang in there, buddy. You look good. Stand up. Let him see how good you look, Jim. He's such a humble man. Woo! Well, what an overcomer you are. What an overcomer you are, brother. We bless you. Thank you for being here. It's awesome to see you. He esteemed the reproach of Christ. Wait a minute. How did Moses know about Christ? But the kingdom, the understanding of being in relationship with God as his people. We are your people, Lord, and we are going to withstand the reproach of whatever they throw at us because we know there's something greater than the riches and the treasures in Egypt. For he looked forward to the reward. Can you look at somebody and tell them to do that right now? Look forward to the reward. Look for, don't look at your current situation. Okay? That's, good. That's temporary. Set your mind on the things above. You don't have to repeat all this now. You're going to run out of breath. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things of this earth. Because that's permanent. This is temporary. So keep an eternal perspective on the way you live your life. The thing you're going through now is not going to last forever. I know it feels that way sometimes. But eternity and, and being with God and ruling and reigning with him for eternity is true. And that makes it so much easier. We have a why that can overcome the how. Yeah. <laughs> and I just wanted to go back to verse 1 because it's such a famous verse. But it's all about this same idea of wait, it's coming. Don't give in to the sin. Don't give in to the temptation. Now, faith is the substance of the things that are hoped for, and it's the evidence of things not seen. I'm curious. How many knew that verse already? That you memorized that verse, right? Because it's so powerful. Now, faith is. This minute, when I need it right now, and I just called it delayed gratification, right? Like that's what the world would say is a really hard thing to do. They've tested children in, in, uh, in, in the labs, and they'll, they'll put out, uh, a mushroom on the table, I'm sorry, a marshmallow, not a mushroom, a marshmallow on the table, and they'll say, listen, I'll be right back. You got a mushroom here, but I'm going to come back and I'm going to give you another one. But if you eat the one that's here, then you can't have the second one. And then they have the camera running while the, while the person leaves. And this kid is like, <laughs> he's trying to reach his hand out. And then he turns his back on the, on the marshmallow and he does all these gyrations. <laughs> One kid, they show you multiple reactions. One kid just went, <laughs> he didn't even take a bite. He didn't hesitate. He just chomped that whole thing down. One of my relatives, probably. And then, and then one kid took a little piece off the bottom and put it back down. <laughs> That's us, right? Isn't that us? Fifty Shades of Grey? Yeah, right? It's not really a lie. I just didn't tell the whole story. That's not a lie. Now you tell the truth, the half-truth, and nothing but the truth. Oh, man, I don't know if I like it here in this church. <laughs> Delayed gratification, man, there's a great reward. 
There's a great reward. There's tests that you pass. When you go in the military, you have to pass a bunch of tests before you get the keys to the F-16. Right? They don't just let anybody in there. And if somebody's going to be in the, in the pulpit here, God cares enough about all of you and the people that are watching to make sure this person's been tested. Because if they're not, then the vulnerable population of the church can be led astray. So it's not just based on gifting. It's based on character. And it's not Peter's character. It's the character of Christ in Peter. Could you stretch your hand towards me? More, Lord. You never have enough. Give them more. Give Trisha more. Give them more together that they have the same vision. That's the greatest thing you could have is leaders that are hearing from the Lord and not being tempted to go in all different directions. And, you know, everybody has some version of delayed gratification. You don't see what you want right away, but you don't give up. Even when I don't see it, he's working. Even when I don't feel it, he's working. He never stops. He never stops working. Sounds like a song. <laughs> the way maker, even when there is no way. Now, I covered this a couple weeks ago, so it's just a quick review because the longer I'm saved and the more I study the word, the more it seems really obvious to me now, but not to everybody, that Genesis 2 is such a key part of the Bible. And you probably know this part. It says the Lord commanded, not suggested, commanded. This really, you could argue, is the first commandment even though it's not one of the ten, the Lord commanded Adam, saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in that day that you eat of it, you already know the rest, come on, what happens? You shall die. There was no death in the garden prior to this decision, but once they ate that fruit, they didn't immediately die, but they brought death into the world. There had been no death. And, and, and people that have gone to heaven and come back, if you ever hear their testimony, one of the things they say is it smells different because there's no decay. There's no death in heaven, and it's something we wouldn't think about because there's death all around us all the time, right? In every season, in the fall, the leaves start to fall, and there's a death and a hibernation, and then a coming back to life, but not in heaven. It's amazing, right? You shall surely die. And the serpent challenges Eve and said, no, you surely won't die. God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. See, so he's making God look like God is insecure. <laughs> he's not insecure. Okay? Because then he says, he's afraid that you're going to be like him and that you'll know the difference between good and evil. So if you get nothing out else out of this today, and you can get free coffee and a bagel so you can at least get that. Just say to yourself, can I handle the knowledge of good and evil? And, and the answer is no, not without the Lord, right? Not without the Lord. He never wanted us to have to deal with all of that. We're finite versions of the infinite God. And that was the one thing he didn't want to put on us to say, you'll just have to listen to me and be obedient. You don't have to recreate all the rules every time. Just listen to what I say. I have your best interest at heart. No matter how crazy the culture gets, this is going to last longer than this culture. It's lasted 2,000 years, this book, because it works. I want to come over and visit you guys over here on this side, too, because I'm always over there. What's wrong with me? Oh, it's because the light's in the way. No, just kidding. We can't handle it without God. We can't handle the knowledge of good and evil. And that way, with God, we handle his version of good and evil. And again, I just was stunned by this picture. But she then, it says in Genesis chapter 3, she ate of the tree. And then the eyes of both of them were opened to the knowledge of good and evil, the thing that God did not want them to see, okay? Huh. And they knew they were naked. They have been naked prior to that, but they didn't know it because that was the way they were born and created. And Adam and Eve hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. So see what we do. We put the mask on. And the real me is behind that mask on the surface. You can see my face, but that's not the real me that you're seeing because I'm afraid if you knew the real me, you wouldn't like me. Marry a prophet. Boy, I'll tell you, that's what I did. <laughs> you learn to deal with the truth real fast. Beautiful thing. God called to Adam and said to him, where are you? Now, just as a hint, God knew where he was. <laughs> okay? God knows everything. He knew where he was, right? So don't worry about that one. He wanted Adam to say what he had to say. Adam said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was 
Now, there had been no fear up to that point. The knowledge of good and evil introduced something into the world that God never meant us to feel. Death and fear and hiding and shame. Sound familiar? Huh. He shouldn't be better at his job, the devil, than we are at getting people saved. Because it's so much better to be saved. Please act Pentecostal for a minute. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Man, so sorry, Lord, that, that we're not willing to be honest enough to just be honest with you and ask you to help us because we think you're going to be mad at us if we admit it. He already knows. <laughs> yeah, so just admit it is a great way. That's called prayer. Just say, I need your help right now. So why would I jump now to Luke chapter 24? We started in Genesis, and now I'm skipping over like 40 books plus in the Bible because I think there's a linkage and a connection that I would like you to see because we know that in the New Testament, the reason that we're victorious is because of the death, burial, and what? Resurrection of Jesus, right? We talk a lot about the cross because that's where the forgiveness of sins came. Because without the shedding of the blood, there's no remission of sin. But we should not shortchange the resurrection. Because Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, without the resurrection, your faith is futile. It wasn't enough that he died on the cross. It was enough to pay for our sin. But the only way he defeated death, which came into the garden with Adam and Eve, was by rising from the dead. That's what defeats death. People had been risen from the, from the dead in the Old Testament, but nobody stayed alive. They had to die a second time. That must have been a bummer. <laughs> and John the Baptist was raised from the dead, and the Jews wanted to kill him again. And he's like, dang, what's wrong? How come I got to die twice? Right? And I'm not meaning to make light of it, but this was a different type of resurrection than the man whose bone, body was thrown on the bones of Elisha, right? He died again, but Jesus never died again. Because he lived all the way through his life, no sin. Without sin, there's no death. Death could not hold you, we sing in what a beautiful name, don't we? So why am I talking about this? Well, it's interesting to me. One of them, this is at, uh, on the road to Emmaus. It says, one of them, Cleopas, asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened there these last days? I'm just going to skip ahead real quick because um, I want to just introduce another point here. Same man now, Cleopas, right, in, I think it's here, if I'm doing it right. Nope, sorry. I, I thought I sent you an updated deck there, Ray, but maybe I messed up. Standing, there it is, John 19, 25. We see this man's name, even though it's got one letter difference, but it says, now the cross of Jesus, near the cross of Jesus stood his mother and his mother's sister and a woman named Mary, who was the wife of, come on, yeah, Clopas and Cleopas are the same guy. You can look it up. You can do your own homework on that. So meaning that this man was married, Cleopas, and they were so close to Jesus and Mary that they were right there at the cross when Jesus died, when Jesus looked at John and said, that's your mother now, he looked at Mary and said, that's your mother. So when we read that in, in, in Luke 24, 18, that they're walking out of Jerusalem after the crucifixion and prior to their knowledge of the resurrection, Cleopas says, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened there these last days? And they were talking to Jesus. <laughs> He's like, well, I do know, but you don't know that I'm him yet. Even though you knew me, you saw me on the cross, but they can't recognize him. Wow, that's amazing. He had the new body, but it was a different body where he could reveal himself to people. And the world needs us to help them understand that he wants to reveal himself to them. Believe that? Yes, he really does because he's got all the answers that they need. So as they drew near to the village in Luke 24, 28, this is Cleopas and his wife. Even though it says two disciples, there it is. He's married. They're going to their house. And, and they both say to him, they drew near to the village, and he acted as if, as if he was going further. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it's towards evening, and day is now far spent. So he went to stay with them. Why does it matter that it was man and a woman? Well, I'm going to get to that. I know you're thinking that. I always thought it was just two disciples. I thought it was two guys. Well, no, this is important. 
So when they, he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it. What does that sound like? You got it right here, right? He took the bread and blessed it and broke it. When was the last time he said that in the Bible? I'll help you out. Thank you. Matthew 26, 26. He said, I'm not going to eat this meal with you again until I eat it with you in the, a little louder, kingdom of God. Well, the resurrected Jesus is now bringing the kingdom of God into the earth in a whole new way. So he's having communion. They just don't know it because they don't recognize him yet. But it says, when he was at the table, he took the bread, blessed it, and broke it. He has blessed you and broken you in a good way. He breaks the pride in us. He breaks the ego in us. He breaks all the counterfeit affections off of us. And he delivers us from evil every day. Thank you, Lord. And he gave it to them. And so you already are making the connection. So there was a meal in the garden, if we think of it that way. She pulls the fruit off and they both eat of it. And then the Last Supper was right before this happened. And this is really the first communion meal in this new dispensation of death could not hold us. And we are going to be resurrected. You know that, right? It's not just clouds and harps. You're not going to be bored when you die and you rule and reign with Jesus. Oh, you're going to have a whole new body. Somebody better say amen to that. I can't wait for that one. And their eyes were opened. So we go from her that we should all relate to and then we go to somehow all the fractured pieces of our lives when we get saved get pulled back together again. Amen? Remember Humpty Dumpty? Broke down and nobody could put the pieces back together again. And, and all this sin just causes so much destruction. But somehow miraculously our maker knows how to put us back together again better than anybody else. So no matter how many fractured pieces there are, when you come back to him, he pulls you back together again and you restore your innocence and all the things the devil tried to steal and take from you, they're gone and then the world gets to see you not hiding anymore. So this is a good time to take that piece of bread out, okay? How much is the world waiting to see the real you? You know the answer, right? This much. He died so the world could see the real you. <laughs> Anybody need a communion cup? Rich Gaglia will toss it to you. So could we just could we stand for a minute and just hold that piece of bread in our hand? This is the best way I can, I can picture it to you, is that before we get saved or before we ask for forgiveness, we're hiding behind a mask of sin, right? And, and we're afraid that God is going to see the real us. Well, don't worry. He already sees you. He's a good father. He knows everything about us. But for his reasons, he wants us to come to him and bring this piece of bread to represent his body. But when it's broken, it represents our willingness to be broken on his behalf. And say, I recognize I'm not enough unless you come. When you come, I'm more than enough. But unless you come, I'm not enough. So let's just break it together for a minute and just think about how he would want us to surrender one more thing at the altar. What's the one more thing? We don't know. But he identified with our weakness in all ways he was tempted to sin, yet without sin. So he has all the answers that we need for every situation that we go through. And as we lift up the broken bread, we just say, thank you, Lord, for identifying with us, for being willing to leave the perfect uh, atmosphere of heaven and to walk this sinful earth and to live 33 years without sin and then to resurrect for the hope that we have. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of what we don't yet see, but we're willing to delay our gratification because you were. You didn't have to come, but the joy that was set before you, all of us standing here, but as we eat this, we say, strengthen us with your power in Jesus' name. Amen. And then we have the cup.
I'll be honest, when I was preparing today, and because the topic is, you know, being free from sin, the Lord just gave me one of those videos, you know, how he'll bring up your past, things you haven't thought about in a long time, and, and what he saved me from. You don't have to dwell on it, but it really does intensify the gratification factor in your life, right? When you realize you probably shouldn't be here. Anybody else think that? If you hadn't gotten saved, you wouldn't be alive. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely in that category. So how can you say thanks for that? My whole life is only because you were willing to come and, and give yours. So we hold a cup up, Lord, and we say you gave your life for us, and we're willing to give ours back to you, even though it feels so hard sometimes to delay the gratification. But, but we're willing to take a stand today for the kingdom and say it's your way and no other way that we want to live by. Help us on this journey of sanctification and, and living our lives for you, that we could walk in that strength, and that we could be a difference maker for the kingdom of God and the earth, that we could be used as weapons of mass destruction to destroy the enemy's camp. As your spirit flows through us, Lord, we receive this cup today to cleanse us and strengthen us in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there you go. When they finished that meal in the upper room, what does it say? Their eyes were opened. Okay? You had your eyes opened? Yes, you've had your eyes opened. And now they recognize him, it says in verse 31. And he vanished from their sight. Now, why would he do that? Because... Once he revealed himself to them, he wants to now reveal himself to somebody else. You could be seated. I know you guys are also obedient. It's a beautiful thing. So in, in all of the Old Testament and until the crucifixion and the resurrection, everybody's still living with that mask over their face. And now Jesus reveals himself to us, and we finally have the confidence in who we are. And our identification is first as a child of God, not as an Italian-American or an African-American or whatever other way the world wants to label you. No, the first identification is child of God. And that means the people around you are brother and sister. And I'm not father. <laughs> Call no man father. Except the Father, right? They said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked to us on the road while he opened up the scriptures to us? And then they told the others in Jerusalem what had happened. This is important, boy. And how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. He was known to them in the breaking of the bread. There's something about this meal of communion that's very special to God and special to Jesus. And you might say, well, why did he tell them to eat his body and drink his blood? It sounds like such a terrible thing. It's communion. He's referencing communion. I feel like I have to repent right now. I know it's cold out there. I'm sweating. <laughs> so when you come to this church, bring a fur coat and a hood. I'm really sorry. I know you think we're wasting the church's money. I really, I have a fan going right here. <laughs> Nothing works. <laughs> Good enough. And I don't want to cool off either. I want to be hot for Jesus. Sorry. <laughs> All right. So there's my repentance for today. Thank you, Lord. So I just want to show you this little algorithm that the Lord's brother gives us in James chapter 1. Like right in the first chapter, if you ever knew anything about James, he didn't pull any punches. Him and the Apostle Paul, they just get right to it. They're not afraid about hurting your feelings when they give you the truth. <laughs> so there's four steps that he describes. The first is seduction. The next is conception. Then third is birth. And fourth is death. And it says it this way, starting in verse 13. No one who is tempted should ever be confused and say that God is testing him. The one who created us is free from evil and can't be tempted. He can't be tempted, so he won't tempt us. When, when you're being tempted, it's not God. Who is it? There's only one other choice. Yeah, it's the devil. When a person is carried away with desire, that's part of that seduction process. You, you stop and you linger too long. And you make room in your heart. And the, and the Sanfords, who we teach a lot from John and Paula Sanford's material... And they call it spiritual adultery always happens before adultery. 
There's some fantasizing going on. There's something being fed that needs to die, but you don't let it die. So it's like having that monkey on your back and you keep giving him a protein shake through watching pornography, through whatever way that counterfeit affection seems to be feeding you. So here's the thing to say, starve the monkey. <laughs> starve the monkey. He'll go somewhere else. When a person is carried away with desire, lured by lust, and when desire becomes the focus and takes control, if love in you is wrong, I don't want to be right. What? Me and Mrs. Jones, we got a thing going on. We both know it's wrong, but it's much too strong to let it go now. Shut up. Please stop talking. That's not true. That's a lie. It's not too strong. God is stronger than you and Mrs. Jones. I promise. You got a thing going on that's going to kill you because Mr. Jones got a shotgun. <laughs> but in that moment, you're carried away with desire. You're lured by lust. And that thing takes control. You're not in control anymore. It's that thing that you gave the, the protein shakes to. And now we don't know what version of it is, but it's not good. Because it gives birth to sin, and sin, it says, when sin is fully grown, what does it do? It produces death. So in case you needed an example, there's a real good one in the Old Testament with one of the real heroes of the faith, which is King David, right? He's the second most written about person in the Bible, only second to Jesus. He was promised that he would be the father of the Messiah, right? I mean, pretty high standing. And it says in the spring of the year, 2 Samuel 11, 1, the, the time when kings go to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him, but David remained at Jerusalem. Note to self, be where you're supposed to be. If you're the king, go to battle. If you don't go to the battle, the battle comes to you. Big time, as a recent president used to say. David remained at Jerusalem. This is not a good idea, David. This isn't how you got to the palace. One afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house, he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. Anybody surprised by that? No. The same man who killed Goliath, drove demons out of Saul, refused the chance to kill Saul in the cave, Remember, he was convicted just to cut off a little corner of his robe, was persuaded by Abigail not to kill her husband Nabal when he wanted to. Strap on your swords. We're going to go wipe him out. Holy Spirit intervened, and he stopped. He was sensitive enough to stop and recognize what he was about to do is wrong. He wrote more psalms than any other composer. He prophesied the crucifixion in Psalm 22. That's David that wrote that psalm. Conquered Jerusalem, returned the ark, Told his wife, you think I was ridiculous? I'm going to be more ridiculous than this. I will sing and praise the Lord. You're not going to make a fool out of me because I'm doing it for the Lord. And second only to Jesus, I said it. He was promised by God his son's eternal reign. Just four chapters before this happened. In 2 Samuel 7, God promised him your son will reign forever. You're going to be the father of the Messiah. But he could not handle the knowledge of good and evil. You look at somebody, say, he could not handle the knowledge of good and evil. Neither can you. And neither can I. We need a savior to save us from this mess. His name is Jesus. Free Bible software, like there's nothing that you don't already have that, that you need that he won't give you. It's available to you. But no, David sent and inquired about the woman because the seduction takes over and now there's a conception, there's a spiritual adultery happening in his mind before the actual act happens. And people give Jesus a hard time in the New Testament because he said, you've heard it say that adultery is a sin. I'm saying if you just look at the woman to lust after her, that that's a sin. Because it leads to the sin. Nip it in the bud. 
Whack-a-mole. Remember whack-a-mole? Kill that thing. Don't give it any roots. Get rid of it. And one said, oh, I think that's Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. And this is just four verses in. We started on verse 1. Four verses in, David sent the messengers, took her, she came to him, and he lay with her, and the woman, five verses it took for this to happen. You're the pillar, the king that did more than any other king prior to you. The promises are off the charts, and yet, in that moment, boom, boom, boom. Stayed on the roof too long, watched this woman bathing, sent for her, we could even give her the benefit of the doubt and say, he's the king. You don't say no to the king. But maybe he seduced her. Who knows, right? She sent and took David. Sorry. Told him I'm pregnant. Yeah, big surprise here, isn't there? Big surprise. It was a fleeting pleasure, but it's going to be a long-lasting disaster for you, bro. Because you get a position of leadership in the, in the body of Christ, there's a higher level of expectation. James also, right, in chapter 3, he said, be careful about standing behind the pulpit. You're going to have higher expectation. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. That's how it should be. And I'm not crucifying David because I'm a sinner too, okay? Like all of us could fall. That's why we have to stay very alert and sharp about how powerful this thing is if we get out of that blessing zone of the Lord, any one of us can fall. I'm really not trying to be up on a pedestal and say that this never happens to us. That's dangerous. Don't talk like that. As soon as you say, I don't have a problem in that area, that's an indication that you could. All right, and I won't go through all the details. It's a long chapter, but this is one of the things that was said through the prophet. Well, first of all, David had her husband, Uriah, killed the the archer shot arrows at your servant, Uriah, and Uriah the Hittite is dead. That was her husband. And when she heard that he had been killed, she mourned. And after time of mourning, David had her brought into his house, and she became his wife and bore him the son from that illicit event that happened. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. Oh, boy, is that true. So I like this picture. It's kind of one of those reality checks. I'll let you look at it for a second. You think everything's going along good. You get promoted. You go to the next level and the next level. And it's like, hey, the guy in front of me just left the company. Maybe I'll get promoted again. Nope. <laughs> There's a reason he's not in the company anymore because the guy in red doesn't want you to be threatening to him. So it's true that we get, we get taken advantage of by the world if we're not discerning. And that happens to a lot of us. But, you know, listen, nobody's completely free from it, but we should be alert in the spirit, right? We sang that song, wake, O sleeper. Open up the windows. Let the light in. Ask for as much revelation as you can get. So I quoted this before. Truth is what we run into when we are wrong. <laughs> A collision in which we always lose. So you can pay me now or pay me later. Be obedient to the word of God or pay the, pay the consequences. And, you know, people still think that they can handle the knowledge of good and evil. They don't want the restrictions of the Bible. And we're here to tell you, try another way. It isn't going to work. This is the best way. And sorry that you didn't just believe that because the people who did are way better off. It might look good now, but, boy... Something else is coming down. Here's a good verse, Job 15. You don't hear quoted very often. The congregation of hypocrites shall be desolate. And fire shall consume the tabernacles of bribery. Man, that's why people don't read Job. And Peter said, it's going to get good. I promise. It's going to get good. It's not all bad news here. The time for judgment has come. The guy with the mic in the pulpit is saying judgment has to begin in the household of God, okay? So you don't start by pointing your finger at other people. You get in front of the mirror <laughs> and say, before you try to judge others, how are you doing, brother? You, you know, you got a telephone pole in your eye, and you're going to pick the splinter out of the other guy's eye. Let's work on us. What do you think, all you guys? Nobody's getting up and leaving, so I better get, keep going. Continue doing good, Peter says in that same portion. Trust your future. There it is again. Delayed gratification. Trust your future. Yeah, it looks good right now, but it's very seductive. And it's going to pull me in the wrong direction. Yeah, but I don't have a problem in that area. 
okay, you want to learn the hard way, go ahead. All right, so David finally realizes, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan said to David, the Lord has put away your sin, you shall not die, which clearly means the death penalty was available as an option, okay? <laughs> you want to read Psalm 51 sometime when he's grateful that God didn't exercise that option to take him out because he could have based on the law. The Lord has put away your sin and you shall not die. However, because by this deed you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. Sound familiar? When a man of God in the pulpit who's well known falls into sin, it gives the enemy a chance to use that and, and to just say, oh, the whole thing's bankrupt. If, if you don't think your pastor's, you know, pulling some kind of con job, he's just a better con man than you think. No, I, I pray, Lord, if that's true, do something to get me out of here. Because <laughs> He doesn't want you to be exposed to that. And I don't either. Of course not. I, I don't. I want to, but I can't love you as much yet as he does. But every day I'm trying to love you more. And to stand up here and lie or, or misrepresent some truth, not going to happen. We would step down before, I mean, I hope we would. Right? You can't even get too proud of what you think you could do. Because you're never more than this far away. It's the sin is crouching at the door and wants to have you. So look, you're going to talk about sin. And the devil is going to, going to try to say, don't do that. Well, I'm going to keep doing it. But look at what happened. The child who is born to you shall surely die. So it brought death. Right? Remember that little algorithm? You get seduced. You conceive, you give birth, and then it brings death. And it could be death of your relationship because you cheated on your spouse and then they're not willing to forgive and take you back. Or death of other relationships when you betray somebody or they betrayed you. There's a million ways death came into the garden when they had that original sin. Jesus gave us the meal and opened their eyes at the breaking of the bread. Can we pray that right now? Lord, open our eyes at the breaking of the bread. As we spend time with you, open up the windows and let your revelation come into our lives about how you want us to live every day. I'll go a little faster. So, thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up adversity against you from your own house. I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. Meaning right in the open, plain day, they're going to all see your sons lying with your wives. For you did it secretly, David, but you're the king. You're the king. I see the heart of the king. I will do this thing before all of Israel. Fleeting pleasures of sin, long-term disastrous wreckage from that sin. Wasn't worth it, was it? One little event with one woman brought all this wreckage into his family. Not worth it. No. No matter how good to make it look. Go to the word. David strengthened himself in the Lord. However you have to do it, find a way to pull on that godly immune system and say no. Be like Joseph. Keep the coat. They that sow the wind, what? Okay, now it's going to get good. You'll start smiling, I promise. Because it's not just sow the, sin, <laughs> sow the wind of sin. It's sow the wind of blessing. So when you sow the wind of blessing, you reap a whole whirlwind of more blessing coming back. It's not just one way. It works both ways. So the more you do this, the more blessed you are. Oh, sorry, I did give you one more. Hell and destruction are never full, <laughs> so the eyes of man are never satisfied. All that the world despises, the, the, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life, it's not from the Father, but from the world. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will... Woo! Please remember that one. That's James 4, 7. Therefore, my beloved brothers, that's what I meant. There's good news in the Bible. It's all good news, really. And it's just opening our eyes to what not to do when we, when we talk about sin. But therefore, my brothers, he's talking to Christians, be steadfast and immovable. Right? Sin's not an option. I'm going to study this word so closely that I'm going to know the will of God in the situations that I come up with. And when I'm not sure, I'm going to go to a senior person, somebody that I really trust who's been saved and, and knows the word, and somebody I look up to, and I'm going to ask them, how should I handle this situation? Right? You're going to do that, right? Right. Don't just assume they're too busy. Pick up the phone and call. <sighs> 
People don't even want to pick up the phone and call anymore. They text you first. Well, I don't spend all my time staring at my phone. So if you text me, I might not know it. Just call. If I can't take it, it'll ring. They even give you that little button that says, sorry, I can't talk right now. That's all. Do it. Pick up the phone. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Amazing. When you get connected in a local church, how the Lord will unfold truth to you in the act of serving. Am I the only one this happened to? It's amazing how much truth God will give you right in the local church. You know, remember that show, Millionaire? Nobody's paying attention. I lost them, Rich. The best help that you got was ask the audience. Ask the audience. There's collective wisdom here. You can't believe how much collective wisdom is in, in the local church. It's amazing. What did it cost you to get in? Nothing. Cost him everything. Cost you a decision to say, yes, I'm going to do this. Always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that the Lord, in the Lord, your labor is not in vain. You, this is great. Paul is writing to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians about how they repented. And there's a truth in here. It says, you felt the sorrow that God had intended and so were not harmed in any way by us. Right? So there's this idea called condemnation, which we read about in Romans chapter 8, verse 1. It says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ, not in the devil. Those who are in Christ, no condemnation. You felt the right kind of sorrow. It wasn't condemnation. It was conviction. Big difference, right? Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation without regret. Worldly sorrow brings death. We'll unpack that one another day. Here's my instruction then. Walk in the Spirit and let the Spirit bring order to the chaos of your life, if you don't mind me adding that word. What did he do? What did the Spirit do in Genesis chapter 1? The world was chaotic. The Spirit hovered over the earth, and God spoke, and the Spirit caused that chaos to be brought into order. How many would like more of that in your life? Hello. Yes, the world's a confusing place. More people are taking more drugs now for anti-depression than ever. So the tools that the world gives you is not going to help you cope. The Lord, get a Bible. Look up Bible Gateway on your, on your phone. Look up Bible Hub. They're free. Amazing tools that we have so there's really everything available that you need. The Spirit will bring order to your life. If you do this, you'll never give in. Wow, really? Paul is saying, if you do this, you'll never give in to your selfish and sinful cravings. Pretty strong word by Paul, isn't it? Never? Really? So if I am giving in to sin, maybe I'm just not walking enough in the Spirit. Maybe I haven't yielded enough to Him and yielded to the Word for everything the flesh desires. Everything? Say yes. It'll go well. Everything the flesh desire goes against the spirit, and everything the spirit desire goes against the flesh. Just facts are your friends, okay? <laughs> really, like, the sooner you realize this, that there's no good thing in me without God, okay? That's a good thing. It makes me want to be closer to him, and he'll keep training me because he's a good father. There's a constant battle raging between your flesh and the spirit of God in you that prevents you from doing the good that you want to do. At one time, Trisha and Peter were, what does it say? We're in darkness? We were darkness. What? How could you be leading a church if you were darkness? Ah, now Peter and Trisha are light in the Lord. And so is Diana. And so is anybody else who received him. What makes the light shine brighter? Getting rid of all the film that the enemy wants to put over us. That's the sanctification process. We shine brighter for him. So I once was darkness, and now I am light. That's the truth of the word right there. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. Try to discern what's pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness. Doesn't mean don't go to a secular job. It's hard. I get it. I've done it for a really long time. I get it. There's sin all around when you're out in the world and you're working. And the Bible says don't be a friend of the world. But you should be the light that's shining in the darkness, don't you think? It's not overcoming. It doesn't have to overcome you. You be the light in the midst of that. And take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead of expose them. If you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God, set your mind 
Oh, Lord, help us to set our mind on the things above, not on the things of the earth. For I died. The old man died. Peter died. And my life is now hidden with Christ in God. Therefore, Peter, put to death that monkey on your back. Put to death that seduction that is trying to get you. Put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, desire, covetousness, idolatry. You sow, I'm sorry, whatever you sow, you're going to harvest. If I sow good seed, I get good, good harvest back. We could stand. I'm almost done. I, just, I would just really like us to, to lift our hands right now and just say, Lord, I'm open to this message. I recognize that sin could still be prevalent. It's, it's, it's crouching at the door, but I say no. I say no. I will plant seeds of life, not death. I will sow to harvest goodness from you. I will sow into truth, not into the lies of the enemy. Those whose seeds go into their flesh will only harvest destruction. You think King David knows about that one. But those who sow seeds into the Spirit shall harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. I want that. May we never tire of doing what is good and right before our Lord because in his season, we will bring in a great harvest. Come on, if I could what? Just persist. Lord, help us to persist in chasing down the truth. Help us to persist in, in having an alert spirit and in being discerning about the spirits that are around us and the influence that we have. And by surrounding ourselves with fire-breathing Christians, with people who take your word seriously, we don't knock anyone else, Lord, but, but we only want to be around people who are going to be redemptive to us, who are going to be speaking life to us. That doesn't mean don't go witness to the world. It just means have a group of people that you can be accountable to, that are going to love you into life in Christ, not compromise you into the ways of the world. There it is. Beautiful. So I just, I just want to speak over you right now. Lord, I thank you for the tribe of King of Kings. I thank you that even though the world is turning upside down with chaos, your spirit in us is that compass that we have for the truth. And that we are not going to fall victim to the way the world thinks. We are not going to compromise in what we believe. We know that sin is real, but we also know your truth is more real than the sin that this world has to offer. And we want to hunger for your truth. You said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. I want to be filled. Say it. I want to be filled with your truth and your righteousness, Lord. And I want to be used in the kingdom to advance the cause of Christ in the earth. In Jesus' name.